Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mindy Mandel, and I am here with Jacob and Jed. We are going on with Plato's Republic. And uh, as always, we are using the Loeb Classical Library. It's the Paul Shorey translation. And there is a link in the description box for any of you who do not have the physical text. So um, just some quick review of what we did last time. Um, we were looking at the proofs. We were looking at um, going back to the original challenge that Socrates was given, show that the just person has a happier life than the unjust person, regardless of whether or not it's recognized by society, but justice in itself, in the soul. Why is that better? And so then he's comparing then the aristocratic person to the tyrant as like the two extremes the aristocratic being the person with the just soul and the tyrant being the person with the unjust soul. And then he was giving different proofs. Now you might recall that last week we saw the first proof was uh, using the logos and saying, what if we picked up a slave owner and took him out of his society and just dropped him in the middle of nowhere? And then what would happen? And there was a whole story with that. Then we got on to the second proof. And here I'll go back to the text here. We saw that there were three parts of the soul. Oh, the camera's going in and out there. Okay, good. Okay, so um, the, uh, we're good? Okay. So we saw that there are three parts of the soul, and each of them has a certain love. There's the money-loving part, or gain-loving, and there's the ambitious, or lover of honor, and there's the lover of learning and the lover of wisdom, and so that corresponds then to the three parts of the soul. And then we saw that there was a pleasure that underlies or is assumed in each of these. And then they looked, and so now what we want to do is compare those pleasures, which pleasure is the truest pleasure, if you will. Okay, and that's pretty much where we ended things. And we saw um, just a few highlights from last time is that the delight of knowing the truth and the reality was called the true pleasure, that only the philosopher, the lover of wisdom, understands all three pleasures, but the other two, they've never tasted the delight of knowing the truth and of touching reality, and so they don't know that pleasure. So they only know false pleasures, if you will, or imitations of pleasure. And that's where we're picking it up. So they're going to um, discuss this more deeply here in section eight. Okay, so if we're ready to jump in, we'll start the reading. Sir, as Socrates? Yes. Since then, there is contention between the several types of pleasure and the lives themselves not merely as to which is the more honorable or the more base or the worse or the better, but which is actually the more pleasurable or free from pain. How could we determine which of them speaks most truly? In faith, I cannot tell. Well, consider it thus. By what are things to be judged, if they are to be judged rightly? Is it not by expertise, oh, intelligence, experience. Sorry, experience. Experience. Sorry. experience, intelligence, and discussion? Or could anyone name a better criterion than these? How could he? Observe, then. Of our three types of men, which has had the most experience of all the pleasures we mentioned? Do you think that the lover of gain by study of the very nature of truth has more experience of the pleasure that knowledge yields than the philosopher has of that which results from gain? There is a vast difference. For the one, the philosopher, must needs taste of the other two kinds of pleasure from childhood. But the lover of gain is not only under no necessity of tasting or experiencing the sweetness of the pleasure of learning the true natures of things, but he cannot easily do so 
even if he desires and is eager for it. The lover of wisdom, then, far surpasses the lover of gain in experience of both kinds of pleasure. Yes, far. And how does he compare with the lover of honor? Is he more unacquainted with the pleasure of being honored than the up uh, than that other with that which comes from knowledge? Nay, honor, if they achieve their several objects, attends them all. For the rich man is honored by many, and the brave man, and the wise, so that all are acquainted with the kind of pleasure that honor brings. But it is impossible for anyone except the lover of wisdom to have savored the delight that the contemplation of true being and reality brings. Then, so far as experience goes, he is the best judge of the three? By far. And again, he is the only one whose experience will have been accompanied by a t intelligence? Early. And yet again, that which is the instrument of or, judgment. Organon, yeah. It's, the Greek oh. is organon. Organon, hmm. organon of judgment, hmm. is the instrument not of the lover of gain or of the lover of honor, but of the lover of wisdom. What is that? It was by means of words and discussion that we said the judgment must be reached, was it not? Yes. And they are the instrument mainly of the philosopher, of course. Now, if wealth and profit were the best criteria by which things are judged, the things praised and censured by the lover of gain would necessarily be truest and most real. Quite necessarily. And if honor, victory, and courage, would it not be the things praised by the lover of honor and victory? Obviously. But since the tests are experience and wisdom and discussion, what follows? Of necessity that the things approved by the lover of wisdom and discussion are most valid and true. There being, then, three kinds of pleasure the pleasure of that part of the soul whereby we learn is the sweetest, and the life of the man in whom that part dominates is the most pleasurable. How could it be otherwise? At any rate, the man of intelligence speaks with authority when he commends his own life. And to what life, and to what pleasure, wait, I said, that's you. Hmm. And oh, to sorry, what so the, sorry, this line was all Jed. How could it be otherwise? At any rate, the man of intelligence speaks with authority. Oh, how could it be otherwise? At any rate, the man of intelligence speaks with authority when he commands his own life. And to what life and to what pleasure does the judge assign the second place? Obviously to that of the warrior and honor-loving type, for it is nearer to the first than is the life of the greedy money-maker. And so the last place belongs to the lover of gain, as it seems. Surely. Okay. Good, let's go back then and make sure that we understand what's going on here. Um, okay, so he tells us that in order to be judged rightly, then there are, th this is at the very beginning of the section, he's telling us, and this is at uh, 582A, there are three criteria that they're going to use.
said Jacob. Do you see what the criteria are to be judged rightly? By experience, mm -hmm. intelligence, and discussion. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And um, for those of you collecting Greek words here, intelligence here is phrenesis. So sometimes it's wisdom here, it's intelligence. That same word. And then discussion is a form of logos. Okay, so you need experience, phrenesis, and logos. And, and then the big question is, of our three types of men, which has had the most experience of all the pleasures we mentioned? Okay, and so that's what we're looking for. Now, um, I want to, um, okay, so, okay, let's just go this way. Um, what does he say then about the philosopher compared to the other two? In terms of how much experience they have. that the lover of wisdom has the most experience because mm. they innately have the experience of the other two. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Good. And now the lover of honor then would be in the middle if they're in the order of the three parts of the soul. And does he indeed put them there? Is that the order that he also puts them in, in terms of their experience? I believe so, the end. Mm. He states that. Yeah, he says. So if you look also at the bottom of 377, how does he compare with the lover of honor? Is he more unacquainted with the pleasure of being honored than that other with that which comes from knowledge? And he agrees that the lover of wisdom would know that kind of honor as well. Um, and with the kind of pleasure that honor brings. Oh, wait, is there a spot where he said, sorry. Um, yeah, maybe it was at the end. Sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, but then key line here, it is impossible for anyone except the lover of wisdom to have savored the delight that the contemplation of true being and reality brings. Um, being here, by the way, is ontos. So it's like the highest sense of, of being. They have a few different words in Greek, or to be. And in the physical world, there's a different word. But this is being, is in the intelligible being. And um, words and discussions is logos. Just one word there. Um, yeah, so let me think. Um, Hmm. Where was I? Sorry. Um, 381. Sorry, I marked something, but I don't know what I marked. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, I think I'm looking at 379. Um, oh, yeah, here. Okay, so if honor, victory, and courage were um, were the test, then you would look at the things that that person loves, right? And if gain was the test, you would look at what that person loves. But since the tests are experienced wisdom and discussion, what follows? And here again... Um, we are looking at uh, phrenesis and logos, experience in phrenesis and logos. Okay, and so what follows of that? And I think it's pretty clear here. This one, I think, runs pretty smoothly. And then you can see that, yes, second place. So the person of honor, then, it means, would know the pleasures of gain, but not the pleasures of, of wisdom of the philosopher, right? The lover of gain knows only that. Mm. 
Okay, so first I'll ask Jacob any questions about this section? Anything standing out to you is still not clear? Nothing in particular. Where, mm -hmm. where was that quote that you mentioned was an important quote? Because I did not find it in the text. Or um, it is impossible for anyone except the lover of wisdom, that one. Yeah. It's towards so. the top of page 379. It's at um, just above D. I see it now. Mm. Mm. And actually, we didn't talk about this instrument of judgment. What is the instrument of that's just a little bit below that? Remember, there's that Greek word in there. And yet again, that which is the instrument or organon of judgment is the instrument not of the lover of gain or the lover of honor, but the lover of wisdom. You can, do you see what the answer is of what is that instrument? See this part and it has that greek word mm. which is organon mm -hmm. which makes me think of aristotle because they have his first right. six works mm. is the organon mm -hmm. but that's probably not yeah yeah so that's what we're looking for so he's selling something is the organon of judgment and then glaucon asks what is that what is that instrument or that organ on? And the answer? Discussion. Mm, exactly, yes. Words in discussion. Which was, and, uh, was it logos? Right, yes. Okay. Yes. So words in dis... So for some reason this translator put in two words there, but logos was translated here as words in discussion. And then down later on where he says the tasks are experience, wisdom, and discussion, he used just the one word, but it's logos again. Okay, so we use logos then as our instrument of judgment to judge our experience. And we need phronesis to truly touch this level of pleasure. Okay, so giving us a little more idea about what phronesis is, right? That we needed to touch this higher level of pleasure. Jed, do you think there are any questions that I left out? Any questions you want to ask? Yeah, mm. uh, only because we are saying how mm -hmm. important the Logos is mm -hmm. to being a philosopher. Mm -hmm. um, there's one Logos that came up uh, right at the beginning mm. uh, it reads, uh, right at the beginning, he says... Okay, sorry, first, can you read from the lobe so that we know where you are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, I've got to find it. Uh, right at the beginning of section eight, mm -hmm. where he says, how are we going to judge mm -hmm. which is the best pleasure to have? Mm -hmm. A bit lost in my text. Mm -hmm. um, he says, how are we going to judge in a graceful way? Mm -hmm. And that stood out to me because grace was one of the only positive things said about solid geometry when we were doing the studies, mm -hmm. but it wasn't really elaborated on. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, yeah, so right at the beginning, how could we, yeah, how could we judge who's, yeah, this the opening sentence, but there's a word grace in there. So I wonder if the puzzle that we had from solid geometry, what the heck is grace uh, or charm? Mm -hmm. I wonder if by tying in that keyword from solid geometry with this section, I wonder if he's demonstrating grace um, because, uh, he's, he did say in solid geometry, it's, it's, uh, teaching and being led by a teacher in a graceful mm -hmm. way. So I wonder if Socrates is giving us an opportunity to weave these two sections together. I mm -hmm. wonder if he's doing a kind of teaching using the dialectic 
at the end of the studies to um, demonstrate what it means to be graceful. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. I don't know. Right, right. Right, and solid geometry was showing us the state of mind at which to approach our our studies, our life. Right. Right. And remember we tied that idea of solid geometry to the modes. Whether you're teaching or you're learning or you're in a confrontation or whatever, there are different there were two different modes. And we tied that to that idea of solid geometry. So yeah. Good, they all fit together. Oh, and of okay. course, there's one mm -hmm. key word that mm -hmm. came up when we talked about this um, organ of logos that mm -hmm. allows us to grasp truth, mm -hmm. um, which is the best pleasure, the pleasure of below Sophia, loving mm -hmm. that pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, he says it's the... Uh, the truth of self. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't get the word self. Right. But I think that's curious. Because that can tie in with our other puzzles, like what is the sun itself from mm. section two mm. and and the cave analogy. Mm. So where was self? Learning in, the truth of self. In the transition. Uh, so this is... Yeah. 582A, mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. before 582B. Mm -hmm. Consider then three types of people. Does it appear that the lover of gain is more experienced of learning the oh, right after. Okay. truth of self mm -hmm. or self-truth? Uh, necessarily truest and most real is what we have here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So mm -hmm. we can wonder is is what is most real and what is true... How does that relate to the self, I wonder? Mm. Mm. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, going on then to section nine, we're going to get into the third proof. So we have three proofs in total. We've done two of them. We saw um, that there, there was first that story of picking up the, the slave owner and moving him. And then we saw um, the second proof that the philosopher has more experience and knows um, wisdom and logos, and so has knows all three pleasures, whereas the other two only know their own and whatever's below them. In the case of the, the honor lover, and also knows gain. Now we have a third proof, and uh, let's jump into it. Sure. That then would be two points in succession and two victories for the just man over the unjust. And now for the third, in the Olympian fashion, to the Savior and to Olympian Zeus, observe that other pleasure than observe that other pleasure than that of the intelligence is not altogether even real or pure, but is a kind of scene painting, as I seem to have heard from some wise man. And yet this would be the greatest and most decisive overthrow. Much the greatest. But what do you mean? I shall discover it, if you will answer my questions while I seek. Ask, then. Tell me, then. Do we not say that pain is the opposite of pleasure? We certainly do. And is there not such a thing as a neutral state? There is. Is it not intermediate uh, oh, sorry, I think that we have the page twice, so just skip over oh, one more. Mm. Intermediate between them. Uh, intermediate between them, and in the mean, being a kind of quietude of the soul in these respects? Or is not that your notion of it? It is that. Do you not recall the things men say in sickness? What sort of things? 
Why, that after all there is nothing sweeter than to be well, though they were not aware that it is the highest pleasure before they were ill. I remember. And do you not hear men afflicted with severe pain, saying that there is no greater pleasure than the cessation of this suffering? Oh, I do. And you perceive, I presume, many similar conditions in which men, while suffering pain, praise freedom from pain and relief from that as the highest pleasure, and not positive delight. Yes, for this is such case. In such cases, it is perhaps what is felt as pleasurable and acceptable. Uh, peace. And so, when a man's delight comes to an end, the, ces the cessation of pleasure will be painful. It may be so. What, then, we just now described as the intermediate state between the two, this quietude, will sometimes be both pain and pleasure? Oh, it seems so. Is it really possible for that which is neither to become both? I think not. And further, both pleasure and pain arising in the soul are a kind of motion, are they not? Mm. Motion, yes. And did we not just now see that to feel neither pain... Uh, pain nor pleasure, is a quietude of the soul and an intermediate state between the two? Yes, we did. How then can it be right to think the absence of pain, pleasure, or the absence of joy, painful? In no way. This is not a reality then, but an illusion. In such case, the quietude is juxtaposition with the pain appears pleasure, and its juxtaposition with the pleasure pain. And these illusions have no real bearing on the truth of pleasure, but are a kind of jugglery. Jugglery it is, so at any rate our argument signifies. Take a look, then, at pleasures which do not follow on pain, so that you may not haply suppose for the present that it is the nature of pleasure to be a cessation from pain and pain from pleasure. Where shall I look? And what pleasures do you mean? There are many others, and especially, if you please to note them, the pleasures connected with smell. For these, with no antecedent pain, suddenly attain an indescribable in intensity, and their cessation leaves no pain after them. Most true. Let us not believe, then, that the riddance of pain is pure pleasure, or that of pleasure pain. No, we must not. Yet, surely, the affections that find their way through the body to the soul, and are called pleasures, are, we may say, the most and the greatest of them, of this type in some sort, releases from pain. Yes, they are. And is not this also the character of the anticipatory pleasures and pains that precede them and arise from the expectation of them? Hmm, it is. Okay, so what just happened? What was that basic argument? What did you get out of that? We'll go back to the beginning. 
Um, okay, so starting out here, he asks us if pain is the opposite of pleasure, right? It is. And then there's a neutral state, right? So we have three. Now, what is the significance of there being a neutral state in, in this passage? That it must be a mixture of pleasure and pain. Hmm. It's a neutral state. Ah, is it a mixture? Let's see, if we go back down to the bottom of 383, um, we're looking at around uh, 584A. And did we not just now see that to feel neither pain nor pleasure is a quietude of the soul and an intermediate state between the two? How then can it be right to think the absence of pain is pleasure or the absence of joy is painful? This is not a reality then, but an illusion. What do you make of that? Maybe we should go a little higher up. We'll hold that idea. Um, but we, he introduces this idea of an intermediate, a neutral, right? And then if you go to the top of that same page that you were just looking at, page 383, so we're looking now at around uh, 583C or D. Do you not recall the things men say in sickness? Right, so after you've been sick, to be relieved of that pain feels like pleasure. Is it a real pleasure, though? No, it's just an illusion. Hmm. Right. And if you've been having a great time and then you come back from vacation, like you go on vacation and you're having the time of your life and then you come back and you're back to that neutral place, it may feel like pain. It's boredom compared to all the excitement. But is it true pain? according to this. It is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do see on mm -hmm. the bottom of 383 where mm -hmm. they, you know, the uh, to feel neither pain nor pleasure mm -hmm. is the quietude mm -hmm. or the interest state. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. But it's not a mixture, but I mm -hmm absence of either of those good yes yes and then so he goes on to say that um the juxtaposition so in such case the quietude in juxtaposition with the pain appears as pleasure right so there's that word appears we always want to watch when plato uses words like seems like or appears this highlighter will work. And in juxtaposition with pleasure, it appears as pain. Right. Uh, these illusions have no real bearing on the truth of pleasure. So remember, in the last section, we were introduced to the idea of true pleasure. What was true pleasure in the last section? was uh, something something to do with truth, uh, just to know the truth. Mm. Right. Who is able to, who has the experience of true pleasure? The lover of wisdom. Right. Yeah. So whatever the lover of wisdom is touching, and then they mentioned ontos or being, whatever that means to touch that, right, um, is what he's talking about when he talks about true pleasure. His camera went out for a moment. Um, hopefully he can still hear us and we'll be back soon. Um, so now we have to see why he's, he's building an argument here. And I think we won't really have time to go into it. The next section is quite long. Um, 
So maybe we'll have to put that one aside. We started a bit late today. Sorry, those of you watching the video. Um, but we're seeing here that he's setting up this idea of false pleasure or the illusion of pleasure. And he's going to contrast that illusion with true pleasure. And take a look then at pleasures which do not follow on pain, so that you may not happily suppose for the present that it is natural of pleasure to be a cessation from pain. Or pain is not only a cessation from pleasure. Hmm. Um, he gives the example of smell as something that you can enjoy without any pain attached to its absence. Right? When you, you step into a room where somebody's baking bread, it just smells so good. It doesn't mean that you feel pain or you feel pained if you're in a different room and you don't smell it. Okay, so there's no pain after that. Um, so we can't believe that the riddance of pain is pure pleasure or that the riddance of pleasure is pure pain. So there's something different. Um, the affections that find their way through the body to the soul and are called pleasures are, we may say, the most and greatest of them of this type. In some sort, it's releases from pain. Okay, so we have like the example of smell as um, coming through our physical senses. But for the most part, he's making a distinction here about pleasure or pain that comes through the body. And so you can guess he's going to contrast it with pleasure that's directly through the soul. But that's going to be the next section. But first here, what is he saying about um, pleasure or pain that comes through the body? That they are releases, the pleasures are releases from pain. Mm. Right, yeah, and vice versa. Body. Yes, yeah. So this description he gave of reaching that neutral state is what most of us experience if we only know pleasure through the body. Right, and this is not true pleasure. So quite a shock for um, somebody who is not a philosopher to discover they've never actually known pleasure or pain. Yeah. And is not this also the character of the anticipatory pleasures? What is he talking about here, anticipatory pleasures and pains? I don't know. I've kind of thought of it like how you get pleasure mm. before you go on a vacation. Mm. You have a vacation planned mm. and mm. you feel like it's going to be a great time, but it's really... Mm. An illusion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you have like desire or fear, right? Oftentimes, like going to the dentist with like with my kids, there's so it's like the fear of what's going to happen at the dentist is worse than anything that actually happens there. It's that's fine once they get there, but like when they were very small, it was such an ordeal to get to the dentist. <laughs> Or sitting in the waiting room, getting into the chair, um, it's that's worse than the actual physical pain of being at the dentist or just getting your teeth cleaned or whatever. So there's that anticipation, right? And that also then can be relieved or let down if it's in the case of the vacation. Was there anything else you wanted to add, Jed? We're good. Okay, uh, we did start late today, and so our time is up. Um, and the next section is quite long, so I think we should probably stop there because it's. I don't want to rush through this next section. I think it's worth going through it carefully because he's going to build on this. So now he kind of gave us the setup, and then what we're going to see next time is he's going to go into the significance of this and how this ties in with what he's calling true pleasures. Okay, so... Um, those of you watching, 
um, whether you're on the uh, live stream on Twitch or you are watching on YouTube, I thank you for watching. And uh, those of you on YouTube can leave a comment and uh, hope you will all join us next time. Thank you very much. So long.